class. So my students, to give you a little context, they're studying uh, the history of the romance novel through the context of 18th century courtship novels and Victorian courtship novels, bodice rippers, and what we think of when we think of the modern historical romance today. So first, Steve Amidown, uh, introduce yourselves to us, and then we have hundreds of questions to ask you about the quote-unquote Indian romance. <laughs> yeah. Sure, so my name is Steve Amidown. Um, I am a librarian, archivist, independent scholar, um, uh, historian of romance, and, and many other things. Uh, from 2016 to 2020, I was the Manuscripts and Outreach Archivist for the Brown Popular Culture Library at Bowling Green State University, uh, which has one of the largest collections related to romance fiction um, just about anywhere. Um, since December of 2020, when I left, uh, I've been a stay-at-home dad and been working on a, a blog called romancehistory.com, um, where I'm sort of trying to condense some things and get some things written down uh, that really aren't out there and elsewhere about the genre, um, to sort of hopefully help scholars and people who are just generally interested uh, in uh, picking up some of this history and understanding it better. That is awesome. And one, one question I would like to ask you, which I realize I didn't give you in the earlier questions, but what got you interested in, in looking at the history of the Indian romance? Yeah, so, um, you know, when I was at Bowling Green, um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was just this history of the romance novel in general um, and looking at the publishing end of it. And, and there's all these sort of interconnected threads because it's, it's not just a book, it's also a, a capitalist item. Um, you know, it's written by people, it's published by people. There's a lot underlying the text. Mm -hmm. um, so I started to get into, into that because, again, that was one of the largest collections we had. Um, started reading romance myself, got really interested in historical romance, especially. Um, and, you know, it, it was one of those things where around sort of uh, Indigenous History Month in November, um, I started looking at like, some exhibits I could set up, and I started looking at some of these books that had come out, um, especially in the eight, 1980s and 1990s, um, mm -hmm. that they, you know, they always featured uh, a Native American, usually a Native American man and a white woman on the cover. Um, there was Savage usually in the title somewhere, and there were a lot of them, and they weren't really talked about anymore in sort of social media space or just in romance in general. And so I got really interested and started digging and digging and digging. Um, and I found that it sort of stretches back even further than the 80s and 90s to the 1890s or 1880s uh, rather. Um, so I thought it was really interesting. And, and I feel like, um, you know, romance has had these multiple reckonings around race. Um, it seems they come up like every year now, like clockwork. <laughs> um, but they, there's never really been this discussion about sort of the way indigenous people were treated in romance novels. Um, and so I, I got interested and I sort of started poking it at people like, hey, you should look at this. Like, this is really interesting. Um, you know, and, and just recently I, I wrote a post uh, partially uh, prompted by our discussions about sort of this, uh, a sort of short version of this history um, of digging into it. So it's really interesting. And I think it's important that for the genre as well as sort of just fans of the genre to understand where these books came from and, and that they existed to begin with. Yeah, that's so fantastic. Yes, I think it's uh, incredibly interesting, um, particularly when we look at the cover art of it. And I know we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but since you brought up the article you posted on your fabulous website, I'm going to share it and ask you to tell us um, a little bit about the history of the indigenous romance. Sure, so um, there's not sort of one starting point to this. Sorry, just a second. Um, oh, 
a little, sorry about that. Uh, okay, a little bit of a glitch. <laughs> sorry, things froze for a second. Um, yeah, so tell us about the history of the indigenous romance and why it's an important and problematic part of romance history to talk about. There we go. I think we're, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, so there, there's not one kind of starting point um, that you can pin down. Uh, you know, as long as there's been an American novel, there have been indigenous characters and there have been love stories and things like that. Um, going back to uh, The Last of the Mohicans, there's an interracial love story in that. Um, so these, they've always been there, um, but I trace it back to um, 1884, uh, a woman named Helen Hunt Jackson uh, writes a book called Ramona. Um, and it was, part of her campaign, she was a social campaigner. Um, in 1881, she had written a book called A Century of Dishonor, um, which was a nonfiction book detailing the ways in which uh, the US federal government um, had reneged on its treaty commitments, um, had mistreated indigenous peoples, and, and how generally uh, they, they were just needed to do better. Um, was was her goal was to to sort of be a social crusader to to make people's lives better. Um, she sent a copy to every member of Congress. Um, so if you go into uh, the the records of um, members of Congress from this time, uh, you will find copies of her book sort of in the Library of Congress and and other places. Um, but it had no real impact. Uh, the nonfiction aspect she felt was the problem. So she wrote this book called Ramona. Uh, a few years later, um, which is the story of Ramona, who is a uh, half uh, indigenous, half Spanish woman um, who was born an, an orphaned quickly after her birth. Um, she's taken in by a, uh, uh, a Spanish colonial family. Um, I can't think of the terminology off the top of my head, I apologize. Um, and she's sort of raised as for lack of a better word, a colonizer in California. Um, in the, the, I think it takes place in the early part of the 1900s. Um, she falls in love with an, an indigenous man named Alessandro. Um, the, uh, the, the colonialists uh, don't like this. They try to drive them apart. Um, eventually Alessandro commits suicide. There's a whole thing there and she ends up marrying um, you know, one of, one of the settlers instead of, instead of her one true love. Um, so all of that is to say that it sets up a number of different tropes that, that sort of start to run through the next century of romance novels and Western fiction. Um, it's, uh, there, there's sort of the noble savage trope that comes up, uh, which is, you know, these people deserve to be treated well um, because they are noble and part of the land and, and all of these things. Um, there's kind of the evil uh, settler uh, trope that comes up, um, except for the one settler who falls for the indigenous person, um, be they man or woman. Um, so, so it sort of set up a bunch of books. And, and I think it's important to talk about the fact that Jackson felt she was well-intentioned as she wrote this book. She felt like her goal was to create uh, better living conditions for the indigenous people of California. That was, that was her only goal in writing this. Um, she died a year after it was published in 1885. And all, you know, her book becomes wildly popular, especially in California. Um, it starts to be employed by uh, the real estate developers of California. Uh, because it presents this kind of romantic uh, vision of the haciendas and, and all of these uh, uh, Spanish dwellings that are in California. Uh, there's a play that was created uh, a couple of decades later called the Ramona Pageant, um, which was uh, 1923 it was created. And it's still going to this day. That was based on this story. And it's, it is uh, California's official outdoor play, I think. Uh, which is an interesting uh, title to grab. Um, and that's this but, image up here, right? Yeah. yeah, that's the image at the top there. Um, the play has actually been rewritten uh, to be more sympathetic uh, to the indigenous people and, 
and to the, the settlers as well, and to create a, a slightly more realistic portrait. Um, but it's still, the, that it still exists is kind of the important part. Um, some, some folks also blame uh, Jackson's book for the Dawes Act of 1887, um, which got to her point of trying to prevent the federal government from seizing land from indigenous people but it did it by breaking up indigenous lands. So it did it by imposing a landowner um, aesthetic on indigenous people who had lived communally for centuries. Um, so it, it created reservations. It, it did all of the bad things we think of when we think of federal government policy um, in the, the sort of late 1800s, early 1900s uh, towards indigenous people. Um, you know, whether it had any direct influence is, is questionable, of course, but it certainly, it certainly was, was part of this movement to, um, uh, to open up California to more private land development um, and take away some of these lands that uh, the, the white settlers felt could be used other ways. Um, so the, the, the book exists, the movie, the, the movie industry gets involved, um, it was actually, it's been remade five times. Um, the, and I think the most recent one was 2005, 2000, it was somewhere 2005 to 2010. I forget exactly when. Um, there's a famous 1910 uh, D.W. Griffith adaptation uh, that I mentioned in the blog post um, that you can actually watch online. It's, it's um, I think it's all of 10 minutes long. Um, but it features Mary Pickford, who, as Ramona, um, so Mary Pickford, who is one of the most famous white actresses of her time, uh, playing this indigenous woman. Um, and that kind of plays into uh, the growth of the Western genre as uh, a written genre, a film genre, radio, television, all of those things. Um, it, it sort of all rolls into that. Um, in 1972, where, when uh, the sort of American romance industry explodes uh, for historical romance. So I'm sure you, you all have talked about The Flame and the Flower. Um, yeah. We're, we're going to be talking about that, yeah. Yeah, so that always comes up. But that same year, uh, there was a book called Nakoa's Woman by Gail Rogers, um, which was uh, I, I forget the exact quote that I got from the cover. Oh, here it is. A fierce Indian warrior, a beautiful white captive, an enthralling love story. And that becomes the prevailing trope uh, for the Indian romance for the next 30, 40, 50 years at this point. Um, it it's always, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, it always involves one uh, white person who's a settler of some sort, and an indigenous person that has either been kidnapped by the white settlers or is kidnapping the white settlers. It, there's always some form of kidnapping. Rape is often involved. There's a, there's a lot of um, uh, white saviorism that, that comes into play because in the end, it's always the white person who saves the indigenous person. Um, and in some cases even turns them against their own people, um, either in war or whatever the whatever the setting is at the time. That's so fascinating and it's interesting as I was looking at this issue a little bit more because I knew I'd be interviewing you. It seems like the majority of the apparent pairings are indigenous man, white woman. And so there's this really intense sexualization of the male indigenous body and this idea of this promise of savage sexuality <laughs> or, uh, you know, really horrible um, fetishization of uh, uh, a marginalized culture. And I was um, looking around some used bookstores at some of the old uh, Flatters Ripper covers. And I, I wish I could remember, I, I have photos of them, I should have dug them up, but um, I wish I could remember the title of the books I found, but I found a number of books that featured Fabio in a clinch cover, but Fabio in brown face. So Fabio as um, an Indian warrior or a chieftain or a savage indigenous lover. 
And so to me, seeing this history is also a history of brown facing in a lot of ways. And as you're talking about the plot of indigenous romance or Indian romances, I should say, the old school ones, um, there's also this sense of trying to whitewash or somehow sanitize um, non-white cultures. Yeah, and, and I think it, it goes to a general pattern of erasure um, of, of trying to sort of put uh, indigenous culture in the past mm. and, and leave it there. Um, and I think, you know, some of that you can sort of look at um, the success of like the AIM movement and, and generally indigenous rights organizations in the 70s and 80s. And, and you look at again, like the rise of, of these novels, uh, which sort of, again, fetishize and, and put indigenous culture in the past as being kind of in conflict, um, you know, a, as a way for sort of, uh, it be, I, I think intentionally or not, I think it became a way for uh, white women to sort of put, put the indigenous men in their place mm. um, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and the Fabio covers are a great example of that. Um, Steve Sandalis, who was uh, uh, the model for uh, Zebra um, and uh, Kensington, um, he appeared in a number of brown face covers as well. Um, there are a lot of those. Um, yeah, that Savage Ecstasy cover is one of the strangest things I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is, uh, this is a tipping point book, actually. So Janelle Taylor, Taylor in 1982 published in Savage Ecstasy, um, which is really the first blockbuster Indian romance. Um, it kind of sets everyone else into motion. So 1982, the romance genre is, is kind of exploding all over the place, um, especially in contemporary, but also in these sort of single title historicals. Um, and this book comes out, it's wildly popular. All of the other authors start to jump on this, um, including Cassie Edwards, uh, who is, is right there as well, um, who writes Savage Obsession a year later uh, in 1983. Uh, between the two of them, I think they published, I, I wanna say north of 150 uh, Indian romances. And that was just two of them. There were, you know, uh, Zebra, Kensington uh, sort of specialized in these books in their historical lines for a long time. Um, so you'll see uh, Savage in a lot of titles, regardless of who the author is, um, you know, and, and all sorts of, of variations that are, are uh, textual indicators to the reader that like, this, this is an Indian romance. Um, so after this, you know, 1982 book comes out, it, it it just generally explodes. Um, from 1984 to 1993, Romantic Times, which was sort of the leading uh, fan magazine uh, for romance, um, actually created an award for the best Indian romance. Um, and they ran that for nine, nine years. Um, so th this was a, a subgenre with some staying power yeah. at that point. Um, and, and so there were just hundreds of these books, um, all of them, almost to a one written by white women, um, you know, who were not uh, in any way connected to indigenous culture uh, in any meaningful way. Um, there were a number of women who wrote these books who were married to indigenous men. Um, Kathleen Eagle uh, is, uh, I believe she's still alive, uh, is married to uh, a member of the Standing Rock Nation. Um, and she's actually written some of the, the books that have flipped a lot of these tropes on their heads. Mm. Um, although she's also written sort of the stereotypical books as well. Um, so there have been, you know, a few authors that flipped it, but it's mostly uh, these white authors um, writing stories. They, they really have no, no uh, business telling in any, in any way. Yeah. And that, that brings up a, an important point and I'll have to check out Kathleen Eagle, because that sounds uh, really fascinating. Um, but one, one thing most people don't realize, too, is really famous romance authors 
like Nora Roberts, who's still really famous today, has written like an Indian romance. And now I can't remember what the title of, of that book was, but um, it's- Yeah, like, like with, with most um, sort of romance trends, like everybody got in on this. Uh, Janet Daly wrote one, at least one. Yeah. Um, Nora Roberts, uh, I believe there's even a Joanna Lindsay uh, book that, that falls into this category. Um, the Kathleen Eagle book that I was thinking of is called Carved in Stone. Carved in Stone, um, okay. I know my yeah, I mean, students will want to check that out too. So I'm going to write that down. <laughs> Kathleen Eagle. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Um, so it's such a popular genre. And as we know, uh, or subgenre of romance, and as we know, romance kind of explores our sexual desire, our relationship to race and patriarchy and class and all these big ticket items. Um, but what's interesting to me about this is that you stated the kind of origins of this was from, uh, of this subgenre, the Indian romance was because essentially a white woman who felt like she was um, doing the right thing, you know, a very well-intentioned person by their definition was actually trying to, I guess, humanize indigenous communities and put them on the map in terms of stories. So um, I guess my question is, and yet, as we know, it's they're perpetuating a lot of racist stereotypes and, and uh, putting forth a lot of really problematic tropes. So how do you see these similar issues, the idea of the well-intentioned or well-meaning white lady by her definition, um, still perpetuating uh, negative stereotypes? How do you see those issues playing out in the genre today? And I know that's a very broad and loaded question. So take it where you would like to. <laughs> so I, you know, I think what, what you'll see is as you look back on um, the history of these books in the 80s and 90s, the authors will always defend it by saying, I did my research. And so they treated it as another run of the mill historical romance where they you know, went and saw, um, you know, saw some tourist trap out West or they you know, went to a gathering somewhere and they feel like they picked it all up and they can convey it accurately in their books. Um, and that's all they're worried about. And I think, you know, we sort of got away very quickly from Helen Hunt Jackson uh, and her good intentions, uh, because in, in the 80s and 90s, authors figured out these, these books sold. Mm -hmm. And that was really what they were interested in. Um, they wanted to write historical romance. So they picked a popular subgenre, you know, did some reading, uh, felt like, again, because the culture and, and because the, the subgenre was, was so reliant on leaving indigenous people in the past, you didn't have to worry about now. You didn't have to worry about today. You could just write about these things and you built on just like in every other uh, historical romance genre, subgenre, uh, the tropes written by other authors. So all of this built off Helen Hunt Jackson, all of it built off um, Janelle Taylor and, and Cassie Edwards. Um, you know, sometimes to the point of, of plagiarism. Um, Cassie Edwards was famously subject to, uh, in the, the mid 2000s was uh, revealed to have taken a number of descriptions from her books, uh, from wildlife textbooks, oh my uh, verbatim. She just, it was just copy and paste. Wow. Uh, you know, but you know, she continued, she published several more books after that. Uh, there, there's never, uh, in romance, uh, the publishers have a very short memory. Yeah. Uh, and often, often so do readers. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so I think that, you know, capitalism was a, was a big motivator for a lot of this. And they felt like during a period when, um, you know, the Western, the Western film was being revived in the 80s and 90s, and you had films like Dances with Wolves, which again is a white savior trope film. Um, you know, all of those stories were, were in the mainstream pop culture, 
And so these authors, again, felt justified in, in making these stories theirs. Uh, how it plays out today, um, these, so a lot of these old books um, are still being published. Um, Kensington still lists uh, Janelle Taylor and Cassie Edwards books on their website for sale right now. Um, so they didn't disappear. They didn't just go out of print and, and fall off the face of the earth. They're not, you know, library pieces at this point. People are still buying them. If you go on Goodreads today, you will find reviews of Savage Ecstasy from, you know, January, February, March of this year. Um, and they're five-star reviews. So these books never really went away. And what we've had now is um, just recently at the, the Romance Writers of America Awards, um, a book called At, At Love's Command by Kate Wittemeyer um, wins for uh, best um, uh, inspirational romance, uh, which is a romance with religious themes. Um, and this book uh, rewrites uh, the Wounded Knee Massacre uh, to be the Lakota's fault. Um, and uh, the, the white hero um, in this case has a, a white heroine. Um, there, there's no interracial relationship because that would, that would go against the inspirational publisher's uh, desires. Yeah. Um, and, and just to, to jump in here for, for my students who might yeah. not know, uh, inspirational romance is are typically yeah, more religious categories and um, by definition more conservative. So, mm -hmm. so and, they, and they're generally evangelical yeah, as well. Evangelical. Yeah. So um, the idea of an interracial romance would be fairly taboo in that category. Mm -hmm. and, and so what you've seen is this sort of conservative idea of white saviorism um, in the 80s and 90s has transferred to the conservative section, section of romance mm -hmm. publishing, which today is, is the inspirational publishers. Um, you know, in, in the case of At Love's Command, it's, you know, a soldier who commits genocide. There, there's no polishing that, you know, the author seems to admit it. And, you know, part of the book is him finding salvation. Um, so that gets into a whole complicated thing. But the point is that it, the, these genocide stories have always been there. You know, they were there in the 80s and, and 90s. It's just sort of slid over into this area where these things are more, more acceptable. Um, to the readership of, of that particular uh, subgenre of romance. And, and I think it's important too, to, to be clear uh, for my students who, who don't know the context as much, but um, the hero literally blames the Lakota shaman or medicine man for um, taking his, his followers to their doom. So he blames it on their spiritual leader, which again, you see the, the religious uh, judgment there. Um, another uh, spiritual center is a bad guy, right? Um, and his whole redemption arc is not remorse for genocide per se. He feels remorse that women and children were involved in it. So he feels zero guilt about protecting the good people, um, the good white people, of the West from trouble from Indians, which becomes, uh, well, it doesn't become, it's an ongoing uh, terrible trope of, you know, the, the dangers of the savage people in the Southwest. So they're at once, you know, hypersexualized, like you see in these book covers here, and they're also really villainized as these threats to white religious social forms. Right. Yeah. The, the, the current, the, the inspirational versions of these stories um, remove a lot of the nuance and the paradox. Uh, and they just sort of say, you know, genocide's okay as long as you feel bad about it. Yeah. Uh, in the end. Um, you know, whereas at least in the 80s and 90s, there was, some, there was something about, you know, the, the white saviorism had, a, had some sort of redemptive quality 
in there compared to these other books. Um, and what do you make, since we're, we're on this topic of the, uh, the controversy of this book winning a, an award to uh, Romance Writer, Writers of America, what do you make of the fact that this kind of a book would be receiving awards today within the genre? So that's a long story. Um, <laughs> and that's a <laughs> question. Take it where you will. <laughs> yeah, no, so, so, you know, longtime observers of the Romance Writers of America uh, who gave this award were not surprised at all that this happened. Uh, the organization was, has, has been deeply problematic since it was founded uh, in the early 80s. It was largely uh, sort of commanded uh, for a very long time by uh, cis white straight women um, who kept out uh, authors of color, kept out LGBTQIA folks, um, you know, and, and kept it very much their own domain. Uh, and, and that for the largest, for the large part hasn't changed. Um, the, the organization has exploded a few times over the years over racism within their ranks, um, racism within giving these awards, um, the, the way in which the judging is done um, for these awards has sort of uh, ended up leaving uh, some really great books by authors of color uh, off the finalist list and off the winner's list in favor of books like this, um, which are either uh, subtly or directly racist um, in numerous ways. Uh, in 2015, there was, excuse me, there was a book that received two finalist uh, nominations from RWA uh, that had, it, it featured a Nazi guard and a concentration camp uh, prisoner falling in love. And this was also in the inspirational category. Um, again, like no one was surprised, people were outraged, but very little changed over the years. Um, so it's just this pattern of uh, white women kind of taking control of the situation and, and deciding that their books are best um, no matter you know, what the topic might be. Um, so there's been a lot of controversy. There, there have been a few changes over the past three or four years, um, but clearly not enough because this book still won an award this year. Um, so you know, it's, it, it seems like they can't get out of their own way at this point. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting um, because if you talk about it, and of course, everything I see on Twitter, a lot of this stuff seems super obvious. I mean, just looking at these book covers, um, I, I love a good classic Clinch cover, but I, I get uncomfortable looking at these because of, you know, you see the problems written on the cover itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so these issues seem so glaringly obvious. It's almost shocking that they continue to perpetuate these um, uh, racist tropes, but also to enable authors to profit from this. So uh, it, part of this underpinning really has to be the, the market points, right? They're continuing to make money and they have that audience there. Um, and it really feels like an issue of, I think trying to center maybe white feminism as somehow reconciling or redeeming those genocide or Nazi narratives, um, trying to find some way to clean it up for, for white audiences. I, I've seen so many people on Twitter post romance novels should include everything but Nazis and genocide or, or you know, things that like, things that should officially be off the table now in 2021. Like mm -hmm. these are not part of any form of redeeming narrative, um, but it's interesting that they keep going back to that to try and reclaim it or minimize the violence of those stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and there's there's a long sort of history of, um, I, I don't know if conflict's the right word, but sort of uh, this, this kind of dissonance between um, the romance writers and their organization and um, feminist ideas and intersectional ideas. Um, 
you know, for a long time, especially in the 1970s, um, feminist theorists were, were constantly attacking romance novels. Um, you can find numerous examples of this. Sometimes they were right, a lot of times they weren't. Um, you know, they were cherry picking certain things and, and saying, oh, this shows that all of these books are bad. Um, you know, and then as, as sort of the RWA and uh, the American sort of authorship grew in the 1980s, there was kind of, uh, they wouldn't have called it white feminism at that point, but it was kind of this, this, there was like this girl power element to it of, you know, we are great because we exist yeah. um, and we don't need to change. And, and so, you know, it kind of snowballed on itself and a lot of authors of color, uh, black authors, uh, Latinx authors, um, certainly indigenous authors were left out in the cold, uh, not just by their own organization, uh, which they, they would join in hopes of, of getting a career, uh, but, al but also by publishers who felt like, you know, those people don't read or those people don't fall in love or, or whatever their excuse was that year. Um, you know, until it took it until the, the mid 1990s to sort of normalize black love stories. Um, which is kind of shocking when you consider that, you know, romance novels have been around for decades upon decades. Um, you know, to, to get to, I'm one sorry. Of, uh, and thinking like one of the founders of uh, RWA was Black, Vivian Stevens. Yeah, Vivian Stevens was an editor uh, with Candlelight, um, with Dell Publishing uh, in 1979, 1980. Uh, and she was the one who encouraged this group of white authors from Texas to create the Romance Writers of America. Um, and so she, you know, was part of that those early years. Um, she and her sister were, were part of the, the organizing of the group. Um, there was a, a, a Latina author um, named, named Selena Rios Mulan, um, who was also on the board uh, at that time. Uh, they were all gone within two years um, for, for reasons that have never really been made clear. But, you know, when, when all of the members of color leave kind of at once, you can guess that, that maybe there was a, a pattern there that was being followed. Um, yeah. So, you know, and, and then the board was, was very white for a very long time. And finally, Black authors and, and authors of color started to get in there in the 1990s. Um, but a lot of the damage had sort of uh, structurally been done in just the way that chapters operated, in the way the organization operated, in the way its contests operated. Um, and that was never really approached until, like I said, you know, the last three or four years um, when everybody kind of said, hey, wait a second, this shouldn't be like this right like the the first uh the first black author didn't win an rwa award until 2019 um which is nearly 40 years after the organization was founded and that that just seems unacceptable um, to any sort of outside observer objective gig, yeah and so as we're talking about these issues within the genre this um uh fetishizing of indigenous cultures, the inclusion of uh, authors of color and centering, uh, uh, you know, love and romance for the BIPOC community. Um, we, we can end our conversation on, on, a, on a positive note, a silver lining, I guess, I don't know, a recentering. Um, but there uh, is more attention coming out now about the importance of Indigenous romance written by Indigenous authors. And actually, one thing I would like to say too, with how a lot of these racist tropes are being perpetuated, um, I first came into seeing this actually through urban fantasy and like paranormal romance specifically, because I'd pick up these books that had an Indigenous focused character and I was really excited about it. And some of them I enjoyed, and then I found out the author was white. And so I started wondering, you know, when is this really their story to tell? And these were, again, people winning awards, um, RWA awards. So in the paranormal romance categories, um, 
And so I started thinking, is this their story to tell? And then as I developed more of a lens, because I read a lot of these things like many moons ago, <laughs> um, I, I started looking back at them and thinking, you know, they're really exoticizing, sexualizing a lot of the culture. They're um, clearly titillated about branding, about Indian stuff. And these are things that are written, you know, in the 2000s, in the 2000, early 2000s, the, the teens. Um, so this is not something that is really even gone away or faded over time, which brings yeah. us the importance of talking about um, indigenous romance written by indigenous authors. So would you like to talk about some cool things that are happening there? Yeah, so, um, you know, in this post, I mentioned uh, two authors specifically, um, but there's actually a great book riot post uh, yes. that came out recently that actually lists eight, um, which is, I think, six more than when I first looked at this three or four years ago. Um, but yeah, Pamela Sanderson's Heartbeat Braves, uh, which is part of a series called The Crooked Rock, uh, or it's built around the Crooked Rock Community Center, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Robin Covington uh, has a series with Harlequin Desire. Uh, the most recent, uh, it's called Red Hawk Reunion. And this is the most recent one taking on the billionaire. Um, you know, there's, there are in this Book Riot article, which I'll, I'll make sure I send you the link if you haven't seen it. Uh, yes, but there are a while. It's really wonderful. And I'm gonna actually share it with my students too. And one, one thing that I'll just shout out quickly too is I'm completely piling all those different lists of stories into one long list to hopefully share with all the world because it, it's nice to see uh, more indigenous authors and stories getting added to that as, as it becomes uh, more of a focus after um, the latest RWA award scandal where people are really trying to shift away from things they can't fix within the institutions and start thinking about, okay, well, what good authors can we actually support who are writing about their own um, experiences or their own communities? Yeah, and I think the, the thing I really love about this list is that um, it's, it includes sort of standalone books, um, what we call category romance, which is Harlequin Desire, um, Harlequin Presents. Um, there are YA romances. Uh, and I think one of, one of the interesting things to point out about this in contrast to what we've been talking about this whole time, is um, almost, I think everything on this list is a contemporary romance. So they're not historical. They're not putting these stories in the past. They're, they're bringing them very much to the here and now, which I think is really vital um, in terms of getting these stories out there. Um, and they're also really good books and, and people have, have been writing glowingly about them and I think that that's just fantastic as well. And one thing I'll, I'll point out too, um, like especially with Heartbeat Braves, you notice that it's white people on the cover. And since we've, we've spent so much time talking about cover art, um, Pamela Sanderson actually has a note in her books. So she's an indie author, she's self-published. And I, I think that's wonderful because I think that's a lot of where the interesting, more inclusive storytelling is coming from in the genre. Um, in all genres, in my opinion. Uh, so they're kind of bypassing traditional publishing, RWA, and just saying, these are the stories I want to tell. So, but one of the issues that comes up with that is they don't necessarily, indie authors don't necessarily have the money for a fancy, exotic, wonderful uh, clinch cover like we see up here. Um, and a lot of the stock photos, unfortunately, only feature white people in romantic embrace. So uh, Pamela Sanderson has specifically said, if you find a picture or know of a situ of, or know of a way in which I can get um, indigenous couples on my covers, please contact me. So mm -hmm. again, we have that story politics, but also the cover politics, which I think is just uh, fascinating. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons I, it, it's so important to get Harlequin on board with this um, because they are still shooting photographic covers um, and using their own photographs. So when when they are bringing indigenous people onto covers, that that really makes a difference. Um, but yeah, I know that that's been brought up with a lot of black authors as well, and just finding good cover 
images in, in stock photos is really difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for talking with me and my students. Um, do you, is there anything else you would like to add about this topic or the work you do um, before we wrap up for the day? Um, not really. I mean, I think I would just say that, you know, understand that this, this is not just a niche of history. You know, the, the history of the romance genre, I think, reflects um, 20th century American history in a lot of ways. Um, not just, as I said, in the text of the book, but in, you know, who gets published, who does the publishing, you know, how, how authors are treated, all of these things, the cover art, tie into kind of uh, the state of, of uh, American culture um, through the 20th century and, and, and the 21st century as well. Um, so I think you know, it, it's important to sort of understand that, that this is, it's more than just the text. I think that's, that would be the message I would leave you with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. This is super fascinating. Um, really just incredible work you're doing. So I can't, I can't wait to share this with my students.